I'm in Banampur, Thailand, and I got a little story for you. I'm going on my morning walk. It's a delightful morning. I got up pre-7 a.m. finally for once in my life, and it's been like almost 100 every day. Gonna get out, get my steps. Appreciate you guys checking out my video. I'm in Banampur, like I said. If you want to learn more about places like this, please just take 10 seconds and subscribe to my channel. It'll also really help push this video out. But uh, I gotta tell you, this town is great if you like to just come and sit under umbrellas at the beach and eat awesome seafood. Let me show you real quick. So these stands lining the beach are open almost every day. I think there's one day a week that they close and uh, really good seafood. I mean, they got some restaurants back there that cook and they bring it over on their little uh, motorbike tuk-tuk things that they've uh, made into a uh, delivery machine. It's awesome. And I was at Bang Sere the other day to try to go to the beach and all they had was those little, little tables and they were all full, but here you can always get a seat at the beach. Awesome seafood, beer, whatever. I mean, it's just a really nice area and uh, very underrated. People don't know about it. Let's get back into the story. I like walking around here in the morning. There's always people out and about, but today I have a true crime story for you. Back from when I was a policeman, and as you can see from the title, a trans gang, a trans gang that I busted. You probably thought from the title, oh, Greeny, Greeny ran into some lady boys there in Bataille and got rolled, caught one of them, something, no. This is from when I was a policeman. Back in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, I was a detective uh, in the Detroit area. And I had a, a rather interesting case that I'll share with you guys. I told my buddy Larry a long time ago I was gonna tell this story because he was kind of uh, the lead actor. And you'll know what I mean in a second. We had to do a little improv, a little acting to get this case going. I'll flip this around so you guys can check out the town a little bit. Not too exciting. Some of it is, the fishing, uh, the raised buildings on stilts. I find some of that interesting, but uh, otherwise just a quiet uh, Thai village. Let me flip this around. So what happened is I was a detective in the mid to late 90s in charge of financial crimes. And that could be anything from identity theft to uh, counterfeit checks, embezzlement, any type of financial crime you can think of and they think of a lot, credit card fraud, all that type of stuff. That's what I handled, that was what I investigated. So one morning I'm reviewing the police reports and uh, going through what I can investigate and what I can't. And I came across a case where a person that lived in my town reported that their identity had been used to order a Dell computer. Remember Dell, Michael Dell? It was a huge like uh, online delivery type of computer company. So they said they didn't make the purchase they canceled it with the credit card company. However, the item had already been shipped, but it had just been shipped. So I was able to subpoena Dell and get the information for the transaction and see where it was going. And I found that it was going to a house in Detroit, which was right next to my suburb. And I tracked the item. It was at the UPS, you know, United Postal Service the brown vans, it was at their uh, warehouse, getting ready to get shipped out. So I was able to talk to the security there. The security at UPS were very, very helpful, very into wanting to investigate fraud. And I talked to them and we concocted a plan. I went to see the local judge in my town, got a search warrant, what's called an anticipatory search warrant. So what we're gonna do is deliver this item the Dell computer to the house in Detroit where the address came back to. And uh, as long as somebody accepted it and signed for it, we would be allowed to conduct a search warrant at that place. If nobody's home or they don't accept the package, they say like, 
yeah, we didn't order that, then, then we couldn't do that. That's, that's what that type of search warrant is. What's interesting about that is, you know, bad guys sometimes when they don't have to have things signed for, they may just have it delivered to a neighbor's and hope it just gets left on the porch at nobody's home. So that's why, that's why we had to make sure that it was signed for and accepted at this house. I contacted UPS and they have a very uh, aggressive fraud and security team there and they were willing to help me. They located the package and it was there. It was still in the warehouse. It hadn't been sent out. It was scheduled for delivery the next day. So we concocted a plan. Uh, I went to the court, like I said, got that anticipatory search warrant and we're ready to roll. We head over to UPS the next day and take my buddy Larry, he's a policeman, but he looks like a UPS driver to me. So when we get to the UPS station, Larry gets in a uniform. They have a uniform ready for him. They have a truck ready for us. And we load up in the UPS van like it's some sort of SWAT van, you know, just empty in the back. And a bunch of police officers had myself and Larry drove and dressed like the UPS driver and a bunch of other um, police officers. We brought a few in uniform and I brought this FBI agent I know with me because uh, the search warrant wasn't actually in, in my city, so that way it made it very easy to bring an FBI agent because they have uh, jurisdiction anywhere in the country when it comes to these type of frauds. So we're loaded in, we pull up to the house, and Larry takes the package up to the door, and the plan is if he puts his hand behind his back, like five fingers open, that means it's a go, hurry up and, you know, run up to the door and we're going we're gonna to hit the search warrant. So... Larry's up there and we can see he does the sign. Well, we had a hard time opening the back door. Like it, it, it wouldn't open easy. And finally, once we got out of the back of that, that uh, truck, we see Larry there in his UPS costume with, his, with a grip around the, the perpetrator, the suspect's wrist, holding the person and the person's trying to pull into the house, fighting with him. Well, we get there, you know, handcuff the person, take care of everything like that, secure the house. And Larry got scratched by the man. It was a, it was a, a black man that was very, very, very effeminate and uh, got Larry a little bit with those long nails. Anyways, secure the person. And so once the person's secure, we start to search. And what we find is quite interesting. The first thing of note was, uh, considering this person had lived alone there, uh, the amount of woman's clothing that we found. Bras, everything, everything. We also found a bunch of fake IDs with that person's picture on it and different names. And found all kinds of checkbooks and scripts from pharmacies among electronics. There was quite a bit of electronics and we found paperwork from other electronics and things like that that were not still in the, in the, in the house there. Well, as it turns out, uh, the FBI agent that I took on the search warrant with me for jurisdiction, I turned uh, a lot of the information uh, as far as the investigation went over to him and he was involved in this thing called the Mall Fraud Task Force. I don't know if you guys know, but the, like the late 90s was like the heyday of counterfeit checks and and you know it was the beginning of internet delivery and you know Amazon all that type of stuff so fraud was high maybe even before Amazon maybe it was just like Apple and Dell computers I handled the prosecution of this individual perpetrator there that was um, misgendering himself as a male and a female depending on uh, whose ID he had but like I said very effeminate and I turned over the rest of the investigation to the FBI agent because, you know, that's the type of stuff they handle. And it turns out it was a whole ring of these guys like this. And uh, some of them were um, a little bit more developed than others, uh, all trans. You know, some had some of the parts, some had none of the parts. But this was a whole ring, man. Late 90s, and they were getting all kinds of deliveries and fake IDs and getting prescriptions. And, and you know, it was like the first internet company but instead of them sending things out they got things delivered to their house and sold it out on the streets that's how they that's how they made a living and they made a lot of money i don't remember the exact amount but it turns out that they had been doing this for a while and made a lot of money 
it was it was months later when uh, the rest of the people were arrested and the investigation continued. But one of the more interesting stories that I remember from my time as a detective. Hopefully you guys enjoyed my short true crime video. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe so I know and I'll tell more of these silly little stories from Greeny's heyday as a policeman. Greeny out.